Joining us with analysis and his insight is Patrick J. Buchanan, former presidential candidate, advisor to Presidents Nixon, Ford, and Reagan. Pat, thank you for being with us. Delighted, Raymond. How are you? Oh, I'm hanging in there. Uh, I want to get into this, uh, w- what you've been seeing over the last few days. Um, you-, you heard Rand Paul reacting to McCain. McCain just seems to be running his own operation here. He and Lindsey Graham are basically, uh, you know, the attack squad within the GOP. How long can they sustain this? And who's their audience besides the, you know, the people on the left? I think a lot of people in the city who are their audience and a lot of anti-Trump people who are their audience and a lot of uh, interventionists and folks who think these recent wars were pretty wonderful and we need a couple of more. But what they're doing is setting themselves up, uh, McCain and Graham, I can understand it. They have no national ambitions left, but they hope to make themselves sort of the South Pole to the North Pole that Trump represents and that they are the voice inside the dissenters inside the Republican Party and in the anticipation that something's going to happen to Trump and people will say, gee, we should have listened to McCain and Graham. And they get tremendous press from this. They travel all over the world and uh, and speak up there. I, from a purely personal self-interest part on their part, uh, it makes a lot of sense what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pat, I, I, before I move on, I want to talk about Russia and, and a couple of other things here. Big news day. Um, we've been getting calls all morning about this Milo Yiannopoulos uh, invite to the Conservative Political Action Committee, then the disinvite, his book contract was canceled. Look, if anybody is the godfather of conservatism, it's Patrick Buchanan. Your thoughts on this Milo character, should he have been invited in the first place? Well, this, uh, my view, I would not have invited him, but let me say this. I mean, this, there is this element of humor here, and that CPAC is going to show up the terrible speech codes being imposed on campuses that don't let <coughs> Milo speak, and then they don't let Milo speak. <laughs> <laughs> as they, what is the comedian that says, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but here's my view. Look, yeah. it's, a, it's an excellent issue, and I might, I mean, just, you know, uh, in this sense, in this sense, philosophical sense, yeah. is where are, the, where, who, where are the lines to be drawn as to what is tolerable and moral and acceptable speech, and who draws those lines? Mm-hmm. Now, in, in, in the 1950s when I was growing up, it was, I mean, you could hear a lot of people talk and use ra- ethnic slurs and things like that, but certain words in, in, in the moral code, you know, in terms of sexuality, were taboo, and you'd be thrown off, the, you know, the seven forbidden words, and you'd be thrown off radio and TV. Right. All those things have fallen down, and, you, and however you make certain comments, ethnic comments, and you're gone forever. But what to me it shows is that the societies lines are, I mean, they're almost gone, but we do have, apparently, <clears throat> you cannot celebrate pedophilia. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, what high standards <laughs> we have. They went a vicious... <laughs> anyway, we're right next to whether the network. Now we're at the Third Reich because you can't openly champion pedophilia. Yeah, I mean, it just shows you what a, excuse me, what a mess our society is in. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's move on, Pat, uh, because I don't want to get you into any trouble here. You know, you'll you'll be invited to CPAC it's, before long and disinvited. No, uh, I'm, I'm left on the far side of that line long ago. <laughs> <laughs> now you know when you know when Pat Buchanan, Pat Buchanan can't get invited to CPAC, but Milo is. Something has happened here. We'll discuss that later. Um, tell me about this Russia. You recently wrote a great piece. Uh, is the Trump Putin detente dead? And uh, this dropped today. And it was, uh, it, it really is about this relationship where Trump was really talking about closer relations with Russia. Is that possible given the climate he's facing here in Washington? And just to give you a little taste, this is Lindsey Graham. If you're worried that We're not going to look long and hard at what Russia did in our election because Trump won and Republicans in charge. You don't need to worry about that. We are. And 2017 is going to be a year of kicking Russia in the ass in Congress. Lovely. The statesman, the the rhetoric is so high-flying, Pat. Uh, Your reaction to this? Well, there's a couple of points. Just what we said earlier in terms of Graham and McCain. I mean, McCain does not 
deliver a speech without talking about Putin as a thug, a murderer, a killer, etc. And Graham saying the same thing. They are the pivot point of the anti-Putin, anti-Russia forces up on the hill, and there are major voices in that. Let me say this: the new, the choices for the state defense, CIA, and the new NSC advisor are excellent in terms of talent and ability. But the question that really comes is, Trump ran on a certain campaign that he's going to try to end this this second Cold War with Russia and work with them against the radical Islamist terrorists, ISIS and al-Qaeda. And the question is, is he going to be able to implement a Trumpian foreign policy which would, you know, seek better relations with the Russians and tell the Europeans to start paying more of their own way and staying out of these wars. Is he going to be able to do that, given the forces not only in his own cabinet, who are who have vested interests, many of them, brilliant guys, but mm-hmm. vested interests in the mistakes of the past, given the opposition of the Washington Post and the interventionists, given the opposition of McCain, etc., is he going to be able to implement a... Trumpian foreign policy, as he described it in the campaign, or will he basically be broken and accommodate himself to the demands of this city, which are for continuation of what was going on? This city was repudiated in the election, and this is the comeback that is taking place right now. Mm. Pat, what do you make of this new um, national security advisor, General H.R. McMaster? He was announced yesterday by the president uh, down in Mar-a-Lago. Um, he's being billed as somebody who will tell truth to power. He wrote, of course, that 1997 book, Dereliction of Duty, which criticized the Joint Chiefs for not standing up to LG- LBJ during the Vietnam conflict. Your take on him is this. I, I always get a little worried when both right and left, the establishments on both sides, are sort of applauding a Trump pick. Is this a good thing? Well, I, I do the same. When you see everybody celebrating what it means, <laughs> it's just right. he's not he's anti-Trump in his view. Right. I mean, that, that rejoicing that was going on was a little too loud for me. But I think McMaster, from everything I've read about him, he is very accomplished. He's a brilliant guy. He was he is not uh, you know go along with the program type of fella. He was over there with Petraeus, and whatever you say about General Petraeus, in Anbar Province, with that surge, they did turn that that thing around so we could get out with a measure of dignity and not lose the war. So I'm sort of impressed with the guy. He has no experience in this snake pit of Washington, D.C., apparently, which is going to be difficult working with a lot of these folks. But again, the key question here is, do these generals, I think three of the five security guys are generals, Do these generals really, I mean, are they committed to the policies which they fought to validate? Are they committed to those old wars? Or are they really, do they look at what Trump has proposed in terms of anti-interventionism, putting America first, staying out of these wars, working out some kind of relationship with Putin and the Russians? Are they with that, or are they going to resist that? So I think this is the battle. It's between the, it's going to come up, it's going to between uh, what Trump promised us was tomorrow and what these fellows, a lot of these fellows represent and will defend, which was yesterday. Mm-hmm. Pat, there's a story that I just came across. I think it's in Newsmax and, uh, and they're, t- or a Reuters story. And they're talking about how the Congress seems to be slow walking or just stalling the Trump agenda. I mean, they've already said there's going to be no Obama repeal, uh, Obamacare repeal or tax cuts. Um, and, and Rand Paul apparently walked out of a meeting uh, last week with the speaker when he heard talk about Obamacare's Medicaid expansion intact and creating tax credits. Your thoughts on this? Are they slow walking or indeed damning the Trump agenda on Capitol Hill? <laughs> Slow walking is what they do. <laughs> I mean, how can you? Not Nancy Pelosi. We're going uh, to repeal and replace Obamacare, and, and people come. You okay? You won. What's the replacement? We don't have one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they only had eight years, years to come up with something, exactly, anything. Exactly. And so, but I do agree. Now, this again with the what I've talked about before. Trump has come to this town, which I mean, he got 4% of the vote, which can tell you what kind of support he's got. He's probably got similar support if it were closet vote up on the Hill. And if these folks don't like his immigration program and they prefer an amnesty and they prefer the John McCain reform and the George Bush reform, uh, then they just don't, they don't act. 
and uh, if they don't, Trump can't get his program through. The same with taxes. Mm -hmm. You can bet, you know, for example, you're going to need a border adjustment tax or a tariff if you're going to be serious about something like that and use the money to cut taxes on on corporate small small businesses and large businesses alike. You've got to have that done, and to do that, you've got to get the cooperation of Congress. And I think those guys do not believe in, in the kind of controls on the border Trump does. They don't believe in the kind of tax program he does. And so I think they slow walking is a good way to describe it. They just, and, but that's, again, Congress is, a, you know, with due respect, it's the first branch of government in the Constitution, lists all these powers, and they've surrendered all, a tremendous number of powers. They don't want responsibility. Mm-hmm. They don't want accountability. You know, Douglas MacArthur said, you know, military councils make cowards out of soldiers. Mm. And you get that big collective up there, and somebody's going to get them and say, well, look, if we do this, we're not coming back next year. Right. Right. Well, uh, you know, you, and that's you said what, that's what's important. Yeah. You said slow walking is what they do. Somebody should have given Nancy Pelosi that memo when she was ramrodding, you know, the Obama agenda, Obamacare and all these regulations through Congress. Well, the they liberals d- believe in government, believe in government action and believe in the constant expansion of government power and programs and beneficiaries and employees mm-hmm. because they are the party of government. Yeah. And the Republican Party, there was, well, it's. I've got a new book coming out, and in it, and I quote this Rob Reichley fellow in Fortune that's about 45 years ago now, but he said Republicans can be broken down into the stalwarts, even the conservatives into the stalwarts, those who accept Social Security and Medicare and move their trench line further on and don't fight it. Mm. And then he called them the fundamentalists, and he mentioned me, the folks that wanted you know do battle and take back territory. But most Republicans, even conservatives, are sort of stalwarts. They accept what has happened, and we set the defense line up down the road. We've now got about 40% of the economy, or 37%, controlled by government. I mean, that's not what it was in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Pat Buchanan, thank you for being here, always bringing both a perceptive and historical perspe- perspe- perceptive to- perception to Good all of this. To you, thank you, my friend. We'll talk soon.